Thanks for being here. Subscribe to Cheating Stories Best, so you don't miss new stories. The wife decided to be secretive, but did the secret concern her husband? Today's story has a similar plot. Enjoy the movie! As we walked along the pier holding hands, I looked at my wife Natalie. Even though we were both approaching 50, she was still as beautiful to me as ever. We probably needed to do more things together to reignite the flame of love into a powerful fire, but the embers were still smoldering. I looked around the parking lot to make sure my other great love, my 2013 Mustang Boss 302, was okay. Then I took Natalie's hand again, and we continued our walk along the docks. In addition to people walking, there were a lot of people on the piers. There were games of chance, different types of food to try, and a variety of performers. I saw jugglers, stilt walkers, singers, musicians, clowns, and even a mime. I hate mimes. We didn't have any specific plans or schedule, the main thing was to just spend the day together and rethink what we had lost. I didn't think we had lost anything. Maybe I saw it as a case where, over time, our heated romance simply cooled to a level of warmth that we could maintain longer. It was as if Natalie thought we were still supposed to be constantly kissing each other like when we first met. We had been together for a long time and were no longer young and fresh. It didn't mean that I loved her any less or that I was less attracted to her. In fact, I probably loved her more. Over the years, we had become more important to each other, we became a bigger part of each other's lives. It would be much more difficult for me to leave her now than it would have been shortly after we met. My point of view on all this was different than hers. She seemed to think that we had lost passion in our relationship. I was sure that we were only lost in despair and uncertainty. I took Natalie's hand and pulled her closer to the water when a mime approached us. Take this, Marcel, I thought, grinning maliciously. Apparently, he was a better mime than I thought because he was able to convey his irritation at being rejected purely through his facial expressions. Oh, let's go on a tour of the lake, Natalie laughed. This looks interesting. I looked at the boat with a mixture of skepticism and outright contempt. The boat didn't seem very seaworthy to me. Come on, Rob, this will be fun, Natalie coaxed, sounding younger than she had in years. I looked at the boat again. This time, I took a closer look at the two-member crew. The captain looked like a former athlete who had relaxed. He still had all the mass he had before, but none of the definition or hardness of his muscles remained. He raised his hat and smiled at us. The long, greasy hair and yellow-toothed smile reminded me more of a biker's mom than it instilled in me any degree of seamanship. The only person I could remember who made me feel less safe was his sailor. The guy was a solo breakdown team. Even when he walked up the ramp to stand next to the captain, who was standing at the railing on the deck, he tripped over the seeming nothingness and almost fell overboard. And the boat itself? Was its name Guppy? It looked like it was left over from the war, the war for independence. I didn't have a chance to get on that boat. Come on, Rob, she said. I need my big, strong husband to protect me from the dangers of the sea. Don't worry, sir, said the captain. This is just a quick tour of the cool places around the Great Lakes. We'll show you some of the coolest hidden islands and the most famous shipwrecks in history. Will you show me the place where the Edmund Fitzgerald sank? I asked. Are you crazy? He asked in response. I've been sailing these waters since I was twelve, and this place still scares me. He looked at me as if there was something wrong with me. I noticed that Natalie was also looking at me as if I had done something wrong. I was just about to take her hand and go home when the sailor intervened. I like all these mysterious islands on the lakes, he said. Some of them are not marked on maps, and some of them are cursed. In fact, they say that an Indian chief lives on one of them, and it is impossible to approach it due to the strong winds and wild waves. We could sail past there. But are we in danger of sinking? I asked. This boat doesn't look very seaworthy. Come on, said the captain. This island is only dangerous in November. In the summer, like now, it is absolutely safe. But give it a couple of months, and this place will turn into hell on earth. There are such strong winds that they will blow the paint off your hull. I have heard of sudden waves which appear out of nowhere, are fifty feet high, and move like water trains. Wow, have you ever seen one of these? I asked. 
he looked at me again as if I had escaped from a madhouse. If I had seen one, I would not be standing here talking to you now, he said. Once again, I noticed that my wife seemed to be taking the side of this lazy, tuna-smelling pilot. Sailor rumor has it that this Indian, I mean Native American, is some kind of shaman, and he is in love with the spirit of the Great Lakes. I have heard of strange purple lightning and out-of-this-world screams coming out of there in the fall. Some say that it was these conditions that caused the Fitzgerald to sink. I also heard that a storm followed the ship from that island to its final resting place. So, we may not go near the place where the Fitzgerald sank, but perhaps sailing close to the island will be the next best thing. I nodded my head and paid for the tour. I decided that if I was going to spend the next three hours with my cheating wife, I might as well do something interesting. I looked at the passengers who were already on board and saw that it could only be described as a truly motley bunch. There was a group of four twenty-something women who had already begun to predictably whisper and giggle. Two of them were quite pretty, on average. The other two also fit the expected stereotypes. One was a tall, strong blonde goddess who had to check her lipstick every 17 seconds. I assumed that the real reason she took out her mirror so often and turned away from everyone was to use the mirror to look around and make sure everyone could see her. The last member of their company, of course, was the fat one. While she wasn't comically obese, she was significantly cuvier than all of her friends, and it clearly bothered her. She wore pants instead of shorts and a long-sleeved blouse to hide her curvy arms, but of course, according to long-established tradition, the blouse was cut so low that it focused attention on what she was most proud of. Somewhere next to the hanging women, there was a guy sitting, that's the only way I could describe it. He was just an ordinary guy. If I weren't already me, I'd think it was me. Like me, he was between 40 and 45, of average height and build, neither thin nor fat. His hair, like mine, was brown and had not yet succumbed to either baldness or graying. In short, he was just a guy. There was another woman in the area close to the guy. She was a very light-skinned black woman who seemed to be alone. She was very, very attractive and could probably be very beautiful if she took care of makeup or things like that. Her hair, which was long, thick, and silky, was pulled back from her face and tied into a very formal bun. Her clothes were very loose and did not add or take anything away from her figure. I couldn't quite make out the contours of her body, but I could tell from her arms and hands that she was relatively slender. Opposite her, but clearly not with her, were two nerdy guys. They were both small, with huge glasses, and were engrossed in discussing something that sounded like homework. The captain and his assistant began to prepare the boat for departure. Just as they began to untie the ropes holding the boat to the dock, two more guys came aboard. Each of them handed the captain a few bills and then stepped on board. They looked around and then settled somewhere near the women. Both were big guys and relatively young. One of them walked around as if he thought he ruled the world, and the second was his henchman. It almost seemed like the second guy was getting paid to agree with everything the big blonde guy said. I noticed that Natalie was taking a special interest in the last two arrivals, much more than in anyone else on board. I stood up and went to sit on the other side of the boat. After a few moments, she came and sat next to me. Nah, maybe you should go back to where you were sitting, I said. Why, Rob, she asked. I'm beginning to see your point, I said. Perhaps we really have grown apart over the years. I probably never saw it. I always thought everything was fine between us. I thought we still loved each other, and although we had grown old, we were still the same people. But we are the same people, she said. We may have made a few mistakes. We may have put something on the line in our marriage, and we need to get back to what's important. That's what today was about. We just need to spend more time together and rethink what made us fall in love. We need to leave the past behind and step into the future together. I think we've grown apart a little, but not so much that we're not the same people. I looked at her, and she seemed sincere. She seemed to be begging for it, but I just didn't understand any of it. Well, if we are different, I began, maybe we should do what Steve and Eddie did. Rob, we don't need this, she said. Our case is completely different from theirs. And I don't know if you're still in touch with Steve, but Edith is unhappy. Everything she's been through has aged her prematurely, and she's never happy again. 
We just need to get to know each other again, understand who we've become over the years, she said. She hugged me and ran her hand over my cheek the way she did when we first started dating. I sighed, realizing that it had been many years since she last did this. It's amazing how much little things like that can mean, I said. I wanted to talk to you about something today, she said, but maybe given the mood we're in, it's worth waiting. Let's just have a good time and see if the captain and his Great Lakes scary tour can entertain us. We might as well talk about whatever it is, I said. I'm really not in the mood for any nonsense. I prefer to get bad news straight. Rob, when two people spend a lot of time together, sometimes they experience life at different speeds. And what you're saying means we've split up, as you've been hinting it all morning? I interrupted sharply. To quickly end this story, you're fed up with us and want a divorce. Since both of our kids are already out of the house and in college, it seems like a good time. She looked at me with absolute horror in her eyes. Rob, why the hell do you think I want this? She asked. You need to know that more than anything, I want us to be together. She grabbed my hands in hers and looked into my eyes. Rob, we've done our duty to society. We've raised two wonderful kids. Sure, we've both made some mistakes, but you're still the person I want to spend the rest of my life with. And I can't say the same, I interrupted. What kind of woman constantly takes another man's side instead of her husband? I'm not sure I want to be married to a woman like that. What are you talking about, Rob? You're not jealous of the captain, are you? She laughed and squeezed my hand tighter. Rob, I was going to tell you that we've raised our kids, our mortgage is under control, and we've done it before we've even turned 50. We're on the easy road and getting close to the finish line. But I think we're seeing things differently. I think you want us to keep saving money, and you're going to keep working at your job for another 18 years until you're ready to retire at 65. This is what ordinary people do, I said. She interrupted me with a look. That's why ordinary people die or become too old to really do anything with their lives, she replied sharply. Today begins a new chapter for us, Rob. This is not the end. This is not me telling you that I want a divorce. This is me telling you that I want us to get to know each other again. I want you to cut back on your work hours and start using up your accumulated vacation time. I want us to travel, go hiking, and visit every little attraction we hear about. I want you to make me remember why all my girlfriends think you're so special and so cute. I want us to spend the rest of our lives falling in love with each other over and over again. Before I could answer her, there was a burst of vibration and engine noise as the good ship Guppy pulled away from the dock. The boat's movement was not as smooth as one might expect, but both the captain and his mates seemed accustomed to it. As we moved away from shore, safety, and my Mustang, I became accustomed to the boat's rough ride. This is not a car, I told myself, so I shouldn't expect it to feel like a car. Lake Superior is huge. In terms of area, it is the largest freshwater lake in the world. It is also the largest real lake. The only lake that is larger is the Caspian Sea, which is not actually a lake. This is the sea, but since it is completely surrounded by land, it hardly meets the definition of a lake. The lake is so big that if we got lost, it would take days or weeks to find us. The lake covers over 36,000 square miles. That's a lot of territory to search, said the captain. He went on to talk about how the lake touches three different states and another country. But don't be afraid, boys, he said, smiling. I know this lake like my bathroom. That got a laugh for most of the passengers, including Natalie, but it didn't do much for me. Two separate thoughts passed through me. The first was that the captain had a rather strong fishy smell. His assistant didn't have one, so perhaps the captain really didn't know his bath that well. The second thought was that perhaps the lake really was the captain's bathroom. That would explain why he smells like a damn fish. The captain's words at least for the first hour and a little more captivated me several times during our journey. I noticed his assistant, Gil, looking at the sky. As I mentioned, the guppy's passage through the water was never smooth, but after about 80 minutes, I noticed a sharp increase in both the turbulence of the water and the harshness of the guppy's movements. When we first started, the sun was high in the sky, and there were few clouds. During the trip, the sun was sometimes hidden behind the clouds, and we were glad for the respite from the scorching rays of the sun. 
but now the entire sky was covered with dark, ominous clouds. I realized that Gil had noticed these clouds far away, and these were the ones he was observing. I'm sorry to cut our tour short, said the captain, but we are very close to a certain mysterious island that I warned some of you about. The waters surrounding this island are known to be unpredictable, and although we can't see this island yet, Superior seems to be freaking out. I guess I shouldn't talk about this island out loud. At first, I thought he was just upping the drama to cover up his ineptitude. What sailor doesn't keep an eye on the weather? Even Gil, who I was sure was not all there, noticed the clouds. But as the captain spoke, lightning struck very close to the boat, and huge drops of rain began to fall into the water. Suddenly, all the passengers left the deck for the cramped quarters of the cabin below. The weather began to deteriorate, and the small boat was rocking. I must admit that the captain and Gil did their job bravely. They were the ones who, more than anything else, prevented the boat from sinking. Wait, maybe I should rephrase that. It would have been better or at least clearer if I had said, as the weather began to deteriorate, the little ship rocked, but for the courage of the intrepid crew, the guppy might have been lost. Looking at the frightened and annoyed faces of the passengers around me, I could tell that we all regretted boarding the guppy. I heard several people express the same concerns. The boat didn't look like it was in good condition, and the captain smelled like fish. Gil seemed like an idiot at best, and now our lives were in their hands. I'll sue, one of the women said. Who will you sue? asked the guy I described as ordinary. The captain probably owns the boat, and from the looks of it, the boat is all he has. If the boat goes down, what do you get? Perhaps you get ownership of a sunken, useless boat. Yeah, then they'll charge you all sorts of fines for cleaning up to prevent damage to the lake's ecosystem and all that, said one of the botanists. The other nerd said nothing. He just turned pale and ran to the small kitchen sink, vomiting the contents of his stomach very loudly. He may have been the only one who vomited, but he wasn't the only one who didn't enjoy the trip. As the boat rose and fell, hitting the waves, we all screamed and prayed for the ride to end. Are we anywhere near that island you were talking about? I asked, scared to death. No, said the captain. That island is at least half an hour from here. For the next few minutes, time and my feelings seemed completely confused. I looked at my watch, and although it seemed like hours had passed, it was only about five minutes. The normal up and down motion the boat made as it floated through the water disappeared. The boat was now moving in all directions and orientations seemingly at random. The bow of the boat often pointed straight up and sometimes straight down and at an angle. We were thrown against the cabin and the walls with some apparent external evil will. Natalie held on to me for dear life, and I did everything I could to reassure her that we would be okay. We didn't talk so much as we randomly spewed out groups of words. We were bouncing off the wall, and I was like, wow, that was big. Then we slid to the floor, and I shouted, they're keeping us moving forward. I tried to keep a brave face more for her benefit than for mine. I noticed that many men allowed themselves to be vulnerable. The big muscle guy screamed like a little girl. I couldn't blame him for that, he was young and realized that he and all of us could die. It felt great to let it all out. The nerds screamed too, and the women screamed almost as loudly as the muscle guy. Then I noticed two things. The first was that the guy who looked like me was doing exactly the same thing as me. He looked for the best and strongest places on the boat to hold onto and position himself so that every time the boat moved, he improved the security of his position. A single woman did the same. This struck me the most. After that, I was too shocked to notice anything when the boat crashed into something extremely hard and the loud sound of the explosion drowned out everything else. I looked at the wall opposite me and saw a huge hole in the side through which water was pouring in. We need to get out of here. I shouted. Everyone on deck. With a hole like that in the side, this boat will sink. As soon as I said that, the muscular guy pushed past the women, pulled open the door, and ran out onto the deck. I helped one of the ordinary women get back on her feet and the fat one too. Then I picked up Natalie and let her out onto the deck. The captain hadn't insisted that we were life jackets, so I started looking for where they were kept. What do we do now? asked the muscular guy. He looked scared. I'm trying to find life jackets in case we end up in the water, I said. Yes, me too, he said. 
he started opening cabin cabinets. The captain and Gil were busy looking for something to plug the hole in the ship's hull and were also trying to contact someone on the ship's radio to report our location and request assistance. I took out my mobile phone and noticed that there was no signal. The rain had subsided, but strong winds were still tossing the boat back and forth like a plug in a bathtub. Given that the boat was leaning a lot, I think we were all a little scared. One of the women found the life jackets. I found them, she shouted. The muscular guy quickly walked up to her, pushed her aside, then grabbed a life jacket. He quickly put it on and began handing them out to the others. About this time, the boat hit something very hard. The impact was so great that we were all knocked down. I saw the captain literally rise into the air and fall badly on his upper back and shoulders. There was a sickening crack as he landed, and then he remained motionless. We all grabbed onto something to hold on. Natalie grabbed me and sat next to me, sobbing for several long, scary moments. At this time, we noticed that the boat had stopped moving. I crawled to the captain and called Gil. I felt the captain's neck until I was sure there was no pulse. I looked at Gil and shook my head. The captain is dead, isn't he? Whined the muscular guy. I nodded. Oh, this is just wonderful, he whined. How the hell are we going to get home now? I looked around and noticed that the boat had actually run aground. I climbed ashore and noticed that we were on a fairly large piece of land that we had somehow stumbled upon during the storm. The others also got out of the boat and followed me. We found ourselves on a fairly large beach. Gil, is there any chance we can fix the hole in the side of the boat? I asked. He just looked at me. Why the hell are you asking him? Asked the muscular guy. Well, because he's the captain now, so he's in charge. We need to make a plan and figure out how we're going to get off this island or signal the authorities so they know we're here, I said. We don't need to do any of that, Grandpa, he said. Everything is automated now. As soon as the company notices that they have lost contact with one of their boats, they will find us. All we have to do is sit back and wait. And frankly, I wouldn't trust the words of this idiot. He and his friend almost killed us. What a captain he is. I ignored him and started walking around the beach. As I moved away from the group, I noticed that I was being followed. I turned around and saw Gil, the muscular guy, and a quiet black woman following me. The guy who was just the guy caught up with me. Are you exploring the island? He asked. I nodded. We need to know what's here in case the rescue the muscle guy talked about doesn't come. I know it sounds stupid, but there wasn't supposed to be a storm this afternoon. There was one expected this evening and another one tomorrow afternoon. I'm George Ignosi, he said, holding out his hand. Robert Sinclair, I said. George, I think we can cover more ground if we split into two groups. Gil and I will go east, and you go west with this lady. Is your watch still working? Yes, he said. Let's meet on the beach in an hour. We probably have no more than three to four hours before sunset. The storm could start by then if it doesn't start sooner. We're looking for a cave or any natural formation that will make it easier to build a shelter in a short time. He nodded, and we parted ways. As Gil and I walked around the island, he seemed to come out of his state of shock. How do you know it's east? He asked. The sun sets in the west, I said. He nodded. You learned that from some survival course, right? He asked. No, I watched a lot of westerns when I was a kid. I smiled. We saw some natural rock formations that might be suitable, but we needed some materials to make them habitable. We noticed many thin but strong trees and several large trees from which we could cut down or break long thin branches. Talking to Gil, I got a pretty good idea of what supplies and tools were available on board the boat. After an hour, I had a pretty good idea of what we needed to do to ride out the storm relatively comfortably. I sent Gil back to the boat with a list of things to bring back. I headed back to the beach to explain what we had found and the plan. If George didn't find a better place, we'd use what I found. Time was short, so we had to act quickly. I was only gone for about an hour, and perhaps it was pure luck that I chose the path I did. This area was a little more wooded than the rest of the area. I later learned that they had decided to pursue a safety in numbers strategy, so every time someone needed to go to the toilet, they went in pairs. 
all the women walked in pairs. Unfortunately, or perhaps intentionally, when Natalie needed to go, no women were available, so she went with him. I heard them talking as I approached. I didn't try to walk quietly until I heard her voice. But aren't you married? He asked her. This is not news, she said. I've been expanding my horizons for a couple of years now. A friend of mine got caught, so I decided to stop. But maybe this isn't the right time to do it. Then I heard a sound that I recognized all too well. I knew what was happening, and I knew what I heard, but somehow it wasn't enough. Then she suddenly straightened up. I almost thought she heard me, but she looked towards the beach, checking if everyone was there. Why did you stop? He asked. And since you are now in charge, I expect you to take care of me so that I come out of this safe and sound. If you do this, I will give you as much as you want. But what about your husband? He muttered. What he doesn't know doesn't hurt him, she said. You can always give him something to do to make him feel important, like send him on a reconnaissance mission or something. I thought I should have been shocked, but as soon as she started talking about how she had been cheating on me for years, everything fell into place. I understood the reason why she suddenly decided that we needed to rediscover each other. Everything became clear. She cheated on me with Eddie, and when Eddie got caught, Natalie didn't get caught. She saw how it all ended for Eddie, and she didn't want that to happen to her, so she started this whole story about rekindling the romance between us. What hurts most is how coldly she did it. She didn't think about me for a second. Being a practical person, I put it aside. Heartbreak or not, the stone was still coming. I walked away from the forest and approached the beach on the other side. As I approached the beach, I saw George and the woman he left approaching from the other direction. We met in the center, and George shook his head. We found a small cave, he said, but it's too small for all of us. The woman tugged at his sleeve. Oh yeah, we also found some trees with berries. Some of them were ripe. I saw a lot of squirrels. Okay. Gil and I found a natural rock shelter that would be good for tonight. We can use some of the tarps Gil said he had on board and some rope. We'll need to make some kind of structure to secure the tarp and use it as walls to keep the wind out, but we'll need to start doing that pretty soon. We won't do any of this, said a voice behind me. While you were off on your little hunting expedition, we held an election. This is still the United States, after all, and I'm in charge now. I noticed the two nerds and the muscular guy's friends nodding their heads in agreement. The other four women did the same. So we didn't vote, asked George. It wouldn't matter, the muscular guy said. There were only four of you. There were nine people here anyway. I decided that if a rescue mission didn't come tonight, which I'm sure it would, we'd just sleep on the boat. Why waste time, energy, or effort on building something when we have a boat? George and I shrugged and headed towards the spot I had found earlier. Hey, the muscular guy shouted. Where are you going? There's a storm coming, I said. We don't have time to waste on you. But I'm in charge, he said. We didn't vote for you, so you're not leading us, George said. What about your wife? The guy shouted. Do you want to try to convince her to come with you or try to fight for her? You already said, I replied. She's with you. I looked straight into Natalie's eyes, and she shuddered. I only fight for what I think is worth it. But Rob, Natalie tried to argue. George, the quiet woman, and I headed away from the beach. As we were leaving, a buxom woman joined us. Dana, where are you going? Asked one of the other women. Listen, Peggy, I already know how this movie ends, Dana said. Four guys, five women, and I'm the fat one. I'd rather take my chances on the other side. And to be honest, they seem more thoughtful. They have a plan and a reason for it. Once we arrived at the place I found earlier, we all introduced ourselves. The buxom girl was Dana, and the quiet one was Ella. Ella was a miracle. She didn't talk much because she didn't like explaining her accent. She called herself a crossbreed, as she put it. Her father was half black and half Hispanic, and her mother was Irish and lived in England. Ella grew up in London and had an accent. She was a librarian and very proud of it. George, like me, was an engineer. The difference was that he was a mechanical engineer and I was a manufacturing engineer. 
I told him about my idea to strengthen the place. The site I chose was at the bottom of a relatively steep hill. There was a vertical notch on one side of the hill. It was like the letter V turned on its side. The idea was to build a fairly large lean-to shelter that would take advantage of the vertical wall at the back and blend into the slope of the hill. As a bonus, there were some large rocks and fallen trees nearby that we could place in front of it once we were settled and to further protect the front from the wind. Since the tarp was waterproof, I wasn't as concerned about the rain as I was about the wind. Gil arrived soon after, and we brought him up to date. The tarps were larger than I expected and thicker. We brought him up to speed and I sent him back for another batch of things. George decided to start construction. Dana and I went looking for suitable branches to tie together for the walls, and Ella returned for the berries she had collected earlier and anything else she could find edible. When Ella returned with more than enough berries for the five of us, I called her over, and she smiled as she approached me. I handed her the fishing rod. What should I use for bait? She asked in her carefully enunciated voice. What did you say? I asked. She smiled and repeated her question. I pretended not to hear her again. Dana came over and told me that George had collected enough posts for two layers of walls. Is it because of the color of your skin? Ella asked. What do you mean? I asked. I asked you the same question two or three times, and you didn't hear me, she said, looking really disappointed. Ella, this is stupid, I said. And I'm sorry you think I'm stupid, she exclaimed. I want you to know, my dear sir, it was at that moment that I couldn't help but laugh. Ella, I never said you were stupid, I laughed. I meant that I was the one being stupid. She calmed down and looked at me. I doubt you're stupid, she said. And since we're all following your plan, if I'm wrong, we'll all get hurt. Ella, I kept asking you to repeat yourself because I love hearing you talk, I said. Your accent, your tone of voice, even the phrases you use are just magical. I could listen to you forever. We both blushed and walked away. Ella! I shouted as she took the fishing rod. The ground near some muddy places is full of worms. Try some of them and also some of your berries as bait. A few minutes later, she came up and took my hand, pulling me towards the puddle. Attach this to my hook, she said, pointing to the big fat worm. George began to work, driving long posts into the side of the hill. If you looked from a distance, they were almost invisible because he very accurately selected the angle of the hill. The next step was to put a tarp over them and then another layer of posts to protect the tarp from being blown off by strong winds. I asked Gil to place a large flat metal disc that he had brought from the boat in the center of the large canopy. I put a lot of crumpled paper and wood chips, as well as pieces of dry wood, in it. A few neatly placed metal skewers above it, and we had both a heat source and a stovetop. On his last return, Gil brought several bottles of water and three cans of soda. Clouds began to fill the sky. It took all of us together to push a large stone and a split stump in front of the wall. Using some smaller pieces of tarp, we made blankets. We also had life jackets that we stretched out and piled up to use as mattresses. The finishing touch was when Ella appeared carrying three beautiful fish. This is what I caught, she said. I'll take care of it, said George. I'll clean them. Gil, help me get the first one off the hook, Ella said proudly. I noticed that the other two fish were still attached to the lines on the rods. Ella approached me after George took both fish and fishing rods from her. I'll just eat the berries, she said. I'm just not a sushi fan. Well, not a sushi fan, I said. What do you think about it? I pointed to my makeshift stove. I don't know what it is, she asked. This is where we will cook the fish you caught, I smiled at her. Smart boy, she smiled back. Maybe I'll eat some after all. Ella, we really don't know how long we'll be here. We won't be able to stay strong eating only berries and greens. So whenever any type of protein is available, I want you to eat it. Be it fish or squirrel or whatever we find. Even if it tastes like fried. You eat it, okay? She nodded. Rob, she called. I turned around and looked at her. I was just wondering, she said in her musical voice, like fried what tastes like. 
We both burst out laughing, and soon everyone came over to find out what was so funny. Before we could explain to them, we felt the first drops of rain. We walked into our hastily built structure. We left the damper behind the rocks open but moved the log as close as possible. After several attempts, I started the fire with my lighter. The small fire and the open damper provided us with light. I took a spit and put Ella's fish on it, which George had cleaned. Over the open fire, I turned them very slowly every few moments. The smell of frying fish was tempting. While we waited for the fish to cook, we took turns telling the others more about ourselves. Dana was full of questions. I feel good, she said. Considering the circumstances, I feel very good. But why didn't we want to wait out the storm on the boat with the others? Because the boat is standing very precariously on the same rock outcropping that smashed its hull, I said. It's unstable. Once the winds start and the tide comes in, either of them could blow the boat off this rock. You mean they could sail away without us? She asked. I mean they could go straight to the bottom of the lake, I said. The lake is deeper than a thousand feet in some places, Gil said. But what about your wife? Ella asked. I'm pretty sure she can swim, I said. Nothing but silence and the crackling of small flames filled the tent as everyone turned away from me in shame. Listen. Guys, I said. Natalie and I were supposed to spend the day today getting to know each other again. I didn't think we needed that. It was her idea. A few hours ago, I caught her doing something she shouldn't have done if she wanted to stay married to me. I also overheard her telling the person she did it with about how she cheated on me for a couple of years. So as far as I care, whether we leave this island or stay here for years, our marriage is over. It wasn't love that suddenly made her want us to get closer. It was the fear of finally getting caught mixed with guilt. In a way, I'm glad I found out now. I can get rid of her and find someone else to spend the rest of my life with before I'm too old to start over. So forgive me. Bad trash. Let's eat. We ate fish and berries, drank water or soda, and talked about other things including what we would do the next day until we all fell asleep to the sound of the wind outside and the rain pattering on the awning. But we built it well, so we stayed warm and dry. The next morning, we all got up to do the work we had decided on the night before. Dana had to clean up and organize the shed, Ella was fishing, George was looking for any small game he could find in berries, Gil and I were going to try to make some kind of signal that would be visible to passing ships. Dana also wanted to visit her friends. Gil, George, and I put our heads together and came up with two practical ideas for signaling devices. One of them was to build a fire that could be lit instantly to provide fire and smoke. The fire would be visible from a distance at night, but the smoke would be much more visible during daylight. We also decided to try to get the large mirror out of the head in the boat. This would be a great way to signal during the day and would not require a flame or power source. We decided to start with the mirror. When we approached the beach, at first we thought that maybe they were all still on the ship. Then we saw them all huddled around a tree, trying to hug each other for warmth. I knew they would dry out during the day from the heat, but it was still a little chilly, and they looked like they were frozen. Then we noticed that the boat had disappeared. They saw us around the same time we realized the boat had sunk. Natalie and one of the young women stood up and swayed towards us. One of the botanists went with them. They look terrible. Why didn't you tell us the boat would sink? Asked the botanist. You knew, didn't you? How did you guys stay dry? Natalie asked. I ignored her. Rob, we need to talk, honey, she said. I have a feeling you're angry about something. Okay, I did it again. I didn't take your side. Obviously, I was wrong. Gil, let's swim and see how far underwater the boat is. I said. We can always dry our clothes by the fire. Hopefully, they'll have something for us to eat when we get back. Everyone else turned their heads sharply in our direction when I said this. Where do you get your food from? Asked the muscular guy, shivering from the cold. You stole all the food from the boat, didn't you? Of course not, Gil said. There's plenty of food on the island. You just have to know where to look and work together to get it. Show us. Mr. Muscles said. We have things to do, I said. 
since you're on the team now, you should get off your fifth place and figure out your next move. But from what I remember from the weather forecast, it's supposed to rain today. What do you mean by working together? Asked one of the botanists. We all have different goals and different parts of the plan, I told them. Some of us are cleaning up our territory, others are getting food, and some of us are going to work on a way to signal ships from afar. You obviously took all the good people, Mr. Muscles said. This is unfair. You left me with a bunch of useless women and nerds. He continued, I thought nerds were supposed to be smart, but all these guys know is comic books and Lord of the Rings. It's really unfair. We should all get back together and be one group. I'll talk to our group at lunch and get their opinion, I said. Why don't you just tell them, he said. Because no one in our group is a leader, I said. We discuss things and act on ideas that we think will work. We all have opinions, and we all have goals. Why are you guys dry? asked the blonde. Her makeup was running down her face, and she was cold and just looked terrible. Our shelter is dry and protected from the wind, Gil said, and the fire warmed us all up quite well. Where did you find shelter? asked Mr. Muscles. We didn't find it. We built it, Gil said. Rob came up with a design. IG, as we call George Ignowski, built it. Dana made it cozy. We're clearly sleeping with the wrong guys, the blonde hissed. Gil and I dove into the water and swam towards the rocky edge of the island. The boat was there, but it was at least eight feet below the surface of the water. I took a deep breath and dived under the water. I stayed underwater as long as I could and still couldn't reach the head behind the mirror. Gil did better than me. He stood up with a small grill. It's not that I didn't like the way you cooked last night, he said, but this will make things a lot easier. Another group started following us as we left. I turned around and spoke to them. Less than 24 hours ago, you all made a couple of really stupid decisions, I said. You are all lucky you didn't drown when the boat sank. I'll talk to our group to see what they have to say about the possibility of everyone uniting again. We'll let you know. Natalie was still following me. Where are you going? She asked. With you, she said. We're still married, remember? In the coldest voice I could muster, I told her, yesterday, while you were pleasuring that idiot, you told him that what I don't know won't hurt me. You were wrong, Nat. Now I know, and it still didn't hurt me that much. I'm ready to leave you and the past behind. As soon as we leave this island, we'll get a divorce. We're done. She just stood there in shock as Gil and I walked away. Over the next three days, the two groups had minimal contact. My group flourished. We found a way to use several long sections of pipe from the ship as makeshift snorkels. This allowed us to stay underwater long enough to get the mirror and a few other things we needed. The only real contact between the two groups was through Dana. She visited her friends every day and returned with terrifying stories. The other group, she said, was close to hunger and despair. Troy, the muscle guy, had turned into something of a pocket tyrant. He ruled his group through fear and intimidation. The women there, with the exception of Natalie, all wanted to move to our group but were afraid of what Troy would do. Dana looked at me when she told us about this. Natalie became depressed. I'm not saying it's your fault, she said, but she seems to think you just wrote her off. I did, I said. What else was I supposed to do? How would you feel if you knew that for the last 20 or so years, you worked your hardest to support someone, loved them with all your heart, went above and beyond to make them happy, and then you find out they've been cheating on you for years? Damn, I wish we could start our divorce while we're on this island so I could get rid of her even faster. Don't you want to talk to her? Dana asked. Don't you want to know why this happened? Who cares? I asked. She wasn't taken by force, she wasn't tricked with substances, and she probably wasn't blackmailed. But even if that were true, she could have come to me, and I would have moved heaven and earth to help her. Why she did it doesn't matter. The fact that she did it, and more than once, tells me that I don't want to be married to her. Women always talk about how all men are idiots and how we chase after everyone that has a hole, but some women are no better. I'm just unlucky to have found such a woman. It's over. I'm not going to turn into some bitter old man who hates all women. I'm sure I'll find someone who sees things the same way I do. 
That morning, I got up early to walk to our section of the cliff that was closest to the water. We roughly shared the island with the other group. The beach was on their property. It was a good deal because most of the fish seemed to be avoiding the beach, but they were numerous around our cliff. As I approached the cliff to check the pole we had dug into the rocky ground to mount the large mirror, I noticed Ella. She was sitting on the edge of the cliff fishing, wearing only her underwear. I wondered, looking at her, why a woman with such curves wore such baggy clothes. Over the past few days, we've kind of split into pairs. With the exception of Gil, Dana, and IG, who spent a lot of time together, Ella seemed to seek my company most of all. We sat together over meals, and she slept next to me at night, often snuggling with me when it was cold. But that was as far as we went. I wasn't sure I could say the same about IG and Dana despite the age difference. I was just about to approach her when I saw them, Troy, his friend, and two botanists emerged from the forest that shared the beach with our territory. They went straight to Ella. Troy grabbed her arm and tried to pull her back in the direction they came from. I ran as fast as I could and didn't stop until I got to them. I pushed Troy away from her and stood between them. What are you doing here, old man? Troy asked. This is not your side of the island. We have a kind of unspoken agreement because we don't believe in each other's ideas. While I was speaking, Natalie and the young women approached from the other side. Dana, IG, and Gil approached from the other side. This side is the side that Gil, IG, and I chose while you sat on your fat steroid fifth place telling us we were wasting our time. This is the land of Gil, IG, and mine. This is the land of Dana and Ella. You belong to the other side. Who said it was Gilligan's Island? Asked one of the women. I'm tired of all this nonsense. Troy shouted. I'm tired of starving. I'm tired of thirsting. I'm tired of being sunbaked most of the day and freezing at night. I was wrong. I picked the wrong people. I thought that with Dave and I being the strongest guys on the island and my nerds being the smartest, we would have the best of both worlds. Turns out my nerds are useless. Two of them have three or four PhDs, but who needs a degree in theoretical physics when you're stuck on an island in the middle of nowhere? Then I thought we have all the women, and it turns out you somehow kept the prettiest one for yourself. I think we need to share the resources on this island so it's fair for everyone. You and the other old man are clearly the brains here, and your friend here is a hunter and gatherer. If I take her, I'll have food, and since you want her back, you'll build me a place to live or even give me yours. Right, old man? No, I said. He spat again. The fat girl comes every day to talk to her friends, and while these stupid women talk to her, I listen. I know they all want to come and stay with you. I heard all their nonsense about how we forced them to sleep with us and that we have no food. Dana bribed them with pieces of squirrel and fish, and she talked about all of you. I know that the fat girl is sleeping with another old man, and I know that you and the little English girl did nothing here, but you like each other. So you just have to decide if you're going to build me a place like yours, or just give me yours. No, I said again. So you're not even going to try to get her back, he asked. I won't have to, I said. You won't take her. Before I could say anything else, a huge fist came out of nowhere and hit me in the mouth so hard that I flew back. I guess you weren't smart enough to see it coming, he muttered. You're smart and all, but it's time for someone to show you your place here. As soon as I stood up, he hit me again. This time, the fist hit me in the eye. Stop, said a female voice. Don't hit him anymore. I'll go with you. I'll fish and pick berries and do whatever you want. Just leave him alone. Smart girl, he said. He stood over me, and I was furious. I hadn't been in a fight since high school. No, I said again. I exaggerated my uncontrollable state as I rose to my feet. I admit you have some guts for an old man, he laughed. You're the only one here who stands up to me. I clenched my fist and swung awkwardly at him. I missed by a mile on purpose. We don't have to do this, old man, he said. Although I'm wondering one thing. Why are you so ready to fight for her when you didn't fight for your own wife? It's easy, I said, still struggling for balance. Ella is worth it. I approached him and pulled my fist back again. He smiled. 
I swung my fist awkwardly, and he leaned back. At that moment, I pulled my leg back and kicked him in the groin as hard as I could. I was sure his scream could be heard across Lake Superior and all the way back home. When he leaned over, I raised my knee up into his face, and he fell. His friend looked at me in shock. You were pretending, he said. You weren't that discouraged. It's cheating. I laughed. He's six inches taller than me, probably weighs 80 pounds more, and has a much longer reach. He's also 20 years younger and in better shape. Is that what you call a fair fight? He was desperate, Dave said. We don't know anything about survival. Troy was always hot-tempered and thought he should be a leader. When we were on the boat, you were always coming up with ideas of what to do, even in a storm. Troy screamed like a girl. It humiliated him so much that he needed his courage back after that. When you left to explore the island, he turned it into a popularity contest and held his own little elections. You should have gone along with it, but you just left us there. I think you were more angry with your wife than with anything else. Troy groaned but didn't wake up. And you can't blame Troy for his wife. He's a guy. She offered herself to him, so he took her. She's not even his type. She's too old for us. It was just fun. I thought it was cool because it meant I was getting a blonde with swimming rings. God, how disappointing. You, Dave, the blonde snorted. You already have several times. And it's not that great, Dave said. The blonde, without makeup, didn't look all that attractive as she stood there and muttered. At that moment, Troy woke up. Dude, are you okay? Dave asked. My groin hurts so much it's throbbing, Troy make a sound in a pitiful voice. Ella slowly approached me. Dave and the nerds had a hard time looking away from her. She took her hair out of its unattractive bun and pulled it into one long ponytail that hung behind her like a black waterfall. Her breasts barely fit into her bra, and her juicy flesh trembled with every movement she made. Troy tried to get up and suddenly screamed so loudly that he almost lost consciousness again. What's wrong now? Dave asked. It's my hand, Troy groaned. I think my arm is dislocated. I grabbed his shoulders, trying not to move his hand. He backed away from me even when I touched him. Listen, I snapped. Your shoulder is dislocated. The longer it stays like that, the more painful and worse it will be. What are you going to do? He asked. If you lie down and shut up, I'll try to push it back into the joint, or at least try, I said. I grabbed his hand and placed both legs on his side. I pulled sharply and strongly. He screamed again and then sighed in relief. Oh damn, this feels so good, he said. You need to make yourself an armband, I said. She will be very sore for the next week, and after the pain subsides, she will be weaker than the other for a while. You should go back to your side of the island and rest. Dave helped him up, and they all left, but there was a lot of grumbling along the way. I suspected that they would soon have a new leader. Ella looked at my face and then ran away. Just let her go, Dana said from behind. What did I do wrong? I asked. Absolutely nothing, Dana said. She's even more obsessed with you now. You got beaten up trying to protect her. Do you know what that does to a woman? When did she start getting really into me? I asked. Ah, since the first night when you told her how much you liked hearing her talk, she said, Rob, do you know what women hear all the time? I mean, you didn't hear what Dave said about Becky. You know how hurt she is right now, believe me. As far as Ella is concerned, you can do no wrong. I continued working on the mirror. I set it up and tried to aim the beam over the edge of the cliff and into the water. I was starting to remember that we had skipped breakfast when I heard a few hesitant steps behind me. I turned around and saw Ella. She had two wide square boards that Dana made for us to use as plates. There was something green and some kind of meat on them, cut into pieces, three or four pieces of each, and mugs of berry juice for each of us. She looked at me and then quickly looked away. What did I do now? I asked. Rob, your eye, she said, and your lip. They'll heal, I said. But they shouldn't, she said. I could catch him a fish for a couple of days and find some berries for him. Maybe he could learn to fish for himself. 
And maybe. I didn't want to be without you for a couple of days, I said. Her eyes widened, and she tried to hide her smile. The greens are different, she said. I saw it growing underwater near where I fish. I asked Gil to go into the water and cut it off. It's like kale, but the taste is a little different. I realized she wanted to change the subject. So, what kind of meat is this? I asked. Try it, she smiled. I took a bite from one of the pieces. It was different from squirrel, less fatty and tasted like chicken, but I knew there were no chickens on the island. Is that a seagull? I asked, chewing and trying to identify it by taste. She shook her head. Don't tell me it's a pigeon, I said, taking another bite. IG caught it, she said. It's a snake. I quickly spat it out and took a long sip of berry juice. Rob, do you know the first time I realized you cared about me? She asked. I shook my head. When you told me you wanted me to eat every kind of protein available, even if it tasted like fried crap. You didn't say that to anyone else. It seems so important to you that I stay healthy. So, now I want you to eat your snake for me. It's not as tasty as fish, but it's protein, and it's better than fried crap. From that moment on, something happened between us. We never discussed it or made an official statement, but we became a couple. Since we couldn't store or conserve food, we began to give our surplus to another group. When we first approached them with a bucket of fried fish and some greens, they pounced on the food and devoured it by the handful. Unlike us, they had no concept of sharing or teamwork, everyone simply grabbed as much food as they could and moved away. One morning, a few days later, Ella and I were sitting on a cliff. She was fishing, and I was watching her in my underwear. Ella rinsed her clothes every day in clean, cool water and left them to dry in the morning sun. While her clothes dried, she fished in her underwear. Usually, by the time her clothes were dry, she had enough fish for the day. Since we became a couple, we hadn't had a night yet, but we started kissing a lot. So, that morning, as she sat there fishing and smiling back at me, I knew we were going to lie on the soft grass and exchange many slow, wet kisses that would last for hours. As I looked at her, she casually raised one of her hands slowly up her side until her long fingers rested on her bra-covered chest. At that moment, teleportation became a reality. One second, I was sitting on the grass about ten feet away from her, I had no memory of touching the ground between us. Suddenly, she sighed and said, Rob, I'm not going to stop. I know, I said. I want you so much. Not even for that boat, she said. What boat? I asked. I stood up and looked at the water. She was right, the boat wasn't very big, but it was moving. I ran to the mirror and directed the beam at the boat. At first, I thought it would just pass by, but it slowed down. Ella and I started jumping and giving signals. The boat turned towards us. Gil heard our screams and ran over. As the boat approached the cliffs, we saw that it was a very small motorboat, probably no more than ten feet long, and there were already three people on it. IG and Dana ran up when they heard Ella and me screaming in excitement. Ella forgot to cover herself, and IG's eyes almost popped out of their sockets. We decided that we could only send one person back. It was immediately decided that it would be Gil. They wanted to send me, but I refused. Gil could tell the authorities about the boat, its registration number, insurance, and all that nonsense. They could also relay our location to the Coast Guard, but cell phones in the area simply weren't working. Why didn't you go? Ella asked as we watched Gil sail away on the boat. That'll never happen, I said. Good answer, she said. When Dana and IG disappeared again, doing their own thing when they weren't around, Ella and I headed to the other side of the island. As soon as we got there, everyone gathered around. Before we even started talking, I heard a small sigh. I looked up and saw that Natalie had noticed Ella and me holding hands. Where's the food? asked one of the botanists. Everything you need will be here soon, I said. We were saved. What? How? Dave asked. Mirror, I said. Ella and I were on the cliff fishing when she spotted the boat. I used the mirror for signals. The boat was too small to take more than one person, so we sent Gil. 
they will send a rescue boat. Everyone got excited, and we heard a lot of talk about the first thing some of them wanted to do when they came back. There were other conversations as well. I heard someone ask if Ella always wears her underwear. I also heard someone asking what we were doing alone on the cliff in the morning. Who cares, someone else said. This is the end, we're going home. A little over two hours later, I was leaning on the railing of the Great Lakes lifeboat as I watched the island slowly shrink. I could still make out where we had set up camp. I wondered what would become of our primitive shelter. A dollar for your thoughts, said a quiet voice next to me. His crisp British accent made the mundane line sound special. My thoughts are worth at least five dollars, I said. Can I try to guess first? Sure, she said. That's a lot of money, especially for a poor librarian. Okay, I said. I talked to Dana. She went back to her friends. She and I.G. got together and talked. He explained to her very nicely that what they had would always be special to him, but it was just an accident that happened on the island. It would never survive in real life. She agreed with him and said he was too old for her, so she would go back to her old lifestyle and he would go back to his wife. The island was just an episode, I said, looking at her. She nodded her head. Is that what you did? She asked. Were you trying to think of a nice way to say this to me? Something like that, I said. I watched as she tried and failed to keep her expression calm. I was just thinking that after our wedding, we could rent a boat and come back here for our honeymoon. Just can't decide whether to invite some of our friends here. And of course, if we have kids, we should bring them here one day. And of course, the kids I already have will want to see this, depending on which side they're on after the divorce. Next thing I knew, she came at me so hard I almost fell over the railing. Somewhere in this tangle of arms and legs, our lips touched for a moment before I heard someone clear their throat. I turned around and saw Natalie standing behind me. Ella, is there any chance I could talk to Rob for a little while? She asked. Ella simply nodded. I'll go and try to consult poor Dana, she said. Is she on the list? I definitely said, and an idea began to form in my head. Rob, what's going on? She asked. You haven't said more than ten words to me since you let me know you knew what I did. We need to talk about this. I talked to Dana while we were on the island, I said. She told me something that just doesn't make sense. I think you have the wrong idea about what happened here, Natalie. As soon as this ship docks, I'll file for divorce. If what you have to say will save me time, let's do it. It just means we won't have to waste time on this later, I said. Okay, Rob. I don't know how you found out, but yes, I cheated on you before we got to the island. But I gave it up on my own and decided to dedicate the rest of my life to making you happy. That's why we got on that damn boat. I wanted us to fall in love again. I quit, Rob. I would never do that again. That should say something, she said. That says. I said, and she smiled. That says nothing mathematically, zero is something. What else did you want to say? Well, you know that Troy forced us all to have an intim with him and other guys, and even as she said it, she knew that I knew she was lying. Nat, do you think I found out that you slept with Troy and cheated on me? I asked. Dana told you, right? She said. No, Nat. You told me yourself, I said. Before you sided with Troy against me, which was the same thing you did with the captain. I was there in the bushes. I saw you satisfying him and how you had an intimate with him. I heard you tell him about her cheating. It's really funny that a guy I don't like at all cared more about our marriage than you. I heard him ask you, what about your husband, Rob? I was afraid, she whined. I wanted to have the best chance of survival. Well, you picked the wrong one, I said. And I paid for it, Nat. Rob, she said. They treated us like. Ella only had to have a night with you. She probably even liked it. We were passed around like party prizes, regardless of our consent. And those two nerds were sadists. Natalie, Ella, and I haven't had an intimate yet, I said. I think we'll wait until the wedding. You can't be serious, she said. Are you really going to divorce me? That's the plan, I said, just like Steve and Eddie. 
Rob, Steve, and Eddie are nothing like us. They haven't been married that long, and they don't have two kids to explain it to. Okay, I said. I had a night with some guys the whole time I was dating Eddie. It was just for fun. It was only a night, and there were no permanent partners. It was just casual, nameless intim, and I always came home to you. I never embarrassed you or did anything with any one of our friends, she said sharply. I waited 20 years while you went to work every day. I was bored. I felt less than human. Tell that to Oprah or Dr. Phil, I snapped. After our divorce, write a book and be on The View, but don't give me that crap. It's such a cliché. I went out and broke my back every day to give you what you wanted. I bought a house in the hood where you wanted to live. I bought you the car you wanted to drive. When you ask for things like that, you have to pay for it. My part of the payment is working hard to pay off the loans. Your part is taking care of our house and looking after the children. If you wanted a change or wanted to get a job yourself, all you had to do was say, Honey, I want to get a job and help. Even if your job only paid for daycare for the kids, it would be almost the same. You can sit here and tell me all these stupid excuses, but you couldn't tell me you were bored. She looked at me as if she had never thought about it. Well, what you're doing is not the same as what I was doing, she replied sharply. I've had a few innocent, minor affairs with guys I don't even remember. You went out and found a woman to replace me. I laughed. Are you laughing because you don't consider your relationship with Ella serious? She asked. Okay, how much time do you need with her before your wounded ego allows us to get back together, Natalie? Ella can never replace you, I said. She smiled. Ella is younger than you, smarter than you, prettier than you, better built than you've ever been, and most importantly, she believed in me before we met. She listened to me and Troy and chose my side when my own wife didn't. As for time, I want to spend the rest of my life with her. What will we tell our friends? What will we tell our children? She asked plaintively. I don't want to end up like Eddie. You can tell them whatever you want, I said. I'll tell them the truth. Once we arrived at the dock, the race really began. I had already told Natalie that I intended to leave the house, so she needed to find another place. Since she couldn't afford the mortgage without a job or significant child support anyway, she agreed. She decided to move in with her parents and pick up her things on Saturday. I got into my Mustang and drove home. While I was there, I called the same divorce lawyer that Steve used. Steve ended up paying 80 pennies, and I hoped for the same. I had one more ace up my sleeve, actually two. While I was busy separating bank accounts and canceling all the credit cards Natalie used, she chose a different path. She called our kids and told them a bunch of funny lies. She hired her own lawyer and tried to fight every settlement offer I made. We went through consultations, even our therapist was shocked by Natalie's actions. The consultations were successful, but they took eight weeks. As a last-ditch attempt to avoid going to court, we went to arbitration. I finally understood what Natalie was trying to achieve. Eddie sued Steve and tried to squeeze all the money out of him in the divorce. She figured that if she couldn't save the marriage, she would get as much money as possible. She would then use that money to continue sleeping with anyone she wanted. The judge didn't give her as much as she expected, and even that was limited to two years. After several months of unbridled fun, Eddie discovered that being a complete, accessible girl wasn't as fun as she thought it would be. She also felt lonely and lacked money. Natalie saw this and tried to do something different. She did everything possible to delay the divorce as long as possible. She figured that if she could hold out long enough, I would bring her back. She also had our kids, her parents, and a lot of our friends that she told the same bunch of lies to in an attempt to convince me to work on our relationship. I begged her to accept one of my settlement offers so we could complete this. The referee was disappointed with Natalie's behavior. In the end, he just asked her what she wanted, thinking we could use that as a starting point for negotiations. Natalie continued to make the most ridiculous demands and said that if she didn't get them, she wanted to stay married. One of her demands was $2 million a year for 10 years. Since I make less than $100,000 a year, this was absurd. The arbitrator wrote a note to the judge about Natalie's behavior and sent us to court. Natalie didn't understand, 
but going to court was the worst possible option for her and the best possible option for me. Our children, who were adults, came to court. Neither of them has spoken to me since Natalie filled them with her. They're in court, in front of our parents and our children, Natalie made her final push. The first witness my lawyer called was Natalie's ex-girlfriend, Eddie. By the time Eddie finished telling me what Natalie had been doing behind my back, my son was angry and my daughter was crying. Neither of them believed Natalie's story anymore. When my second witness was called, Natalie sank even deeper into her chair. She and her lawyer tried to stop Troy from testifying, but the judge wanted to hear what he had to say. By the time Troy finished laying out everything Natalie had done on the island, even I was amazed. The judge used his full discretion in determining the terms of the divorce. State law required all assets to be divided equally, but he was allowed some discretion in how this was done. I had already given Natalie half of our joint bills and allowed her to take any and all things in the house that she wanted. He allowed her to keep her car, allowed me to buy out her share of the mortgage, and gave her a token alimony of $1 a week for two years. Natalie had already spent money from our joint accounts that were given to her, which put her in a difficult position because we took out a second mortgage to pay for both children's education. We didn't have much equity in the house. Natalie had to pay her own legal fees, and although her lawyer delayed the divorce at Natalie's request, he still charged her for his time. As a result, Natalie ended up in debt. Our house cost $110,000, we owed $30,000 on the first mortgage and another $40,000 on the second. This meant that our joint equity in the house was $40,000. I gave Natalie $20,000. She owed her lawyer $22,000. To help her, I offered to pay all alimony money in one sum. I gave her five fresh $20 bills and 16 quarters and walked away from her. Almost exactly six months after I left court, I was back on the dock with Ella, looking at the huge ship moored there. She squeezed my hand. Daddy! Ella shouted from behind. My daughter Susan ran up and hugged us both. She introduced us to a small, modest man who turned out to be her boyfriend, and they boarded the ship. Her grandparents on both sides were already on board. I was still in shock over the fact that I remained relatively close to Natalie's parents. After all, they were my children's grandparents. I.G. and his wife smiled at me from the top deck. I shook my head, and Ella nudged me. Be kind, she said. Dane arrived with a guy who looked like Gil, subsequently. I would have to explain how they ended up together. Troy and Dave arrived, each accompanied by pretty coets. Events on the island changed a lot in their lives. The botanists arrived alone. My son was already on the island. He rented a helicopter and flew there as part of our backup plan. The only people who were with us on the island and were not present were Dana's three friends. They all felt they had been treated badly there and didn't want to remember it. And of course, Natalie wasn't there. It's not that she didn't want to, but after our divorce, things weren't going very well for Natalie. Most of the men she dated weren't very nice, and she ended up with a few bruises and scrapes. It's also a fact that the money from her job as a receptionist didn't pay very well, so she couldn't afford a nice dress. The biggest reason, however, was that she was in prison. She felt betrayed by Eddie's testimony. On the other hand, Eddie felt abandoned by Natalie during her own divorce so although they were birds of a feather, they rarely got together. However, a few nights ago, they ended up at the same bar and got into a fight over the same man. The judge sentenced them each to a week in prison for damaging property, disturbing the peace, mutual assault charges, and public drunkenness. As the large ship pulled away from the dock, a second smaller ship followed us at a distance. I wanted to see our little island again. We wanted to get married there, and while everyone else slept in the comfort of the ship, Ella and I would spend the first night of our honeymoon in our primitive shelter. We would then board a helicopter and return to catch the start of our real honeymoon in Vegas. A dollar for your thoughts, Ella said next to me. Oh, I don't have to pay for them anymore. We'll be married in a couple of hours, and we'll be together forever. I'll never do anything to lose you. I love you too much. I could listen to you forever, I said, but what I was actually remembering was just before I fought with Troy over you on the island. Do you remember what I called this place? I asked. Yeah, you called it Gilligan's Island, she said, laughing. No, what did I say? 
This is the land of Gil, Egg, and me. Maybe the three of us should look into the possibility of buying it. Maybe not, she said, but we lived happily ever after. What do you think of our story today? In my opinion, I am very sorry for the man's situation. I would never wish anything like what happened to him on anyone in my life. What's your opinion? Write in the comments. See you in the next video.